He holds a PhD in chemistry from the University of Chicago and was a Herman and Margaret Foucault Foundation Fellow, postdoctoral fellow in cancer research at MIT. He has been a recipient of FEDS Outstanding Young, Young Investigator Award and was most recently awarded Regents Teaching Award, the highest teaching award across the entire University of Texas system of institutions. Professor Zaman joined Boston University from UT Austin in fall 2009. Dr. Zaman's research focuses on understanding, understanding the system biology of tumor invasion and metastasis. The second main thrust of his research focuses on developing computational and experimental tools to improve the quality of life, education, and the practice of medicine in the developing world. He is working closely with institutions of higher learning in curriculum development and implementation. In addition, how are you? he partners with various nonprofits around the globe, in particular with developing countries, to develop cheap, robust, and easy to use solutions to develop improved diagnostics in remote areas. Please join me. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a, <coughs> it's a real honor to be here. Um, I have to be honest, I didn't know about this institute until I, I, I got an email from a close friend. But um, the more I've learned and the more I've read, I, I found it to be... Okay, that's I'll just, yeah. the, the more I, I appreciate the work that you are, you are doing. So I'm, I'm really honored. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is some of the work that we've been doing in improving the quality of higher education in developing countries. Um, we are very fortunate. Uh, I'm going to love to be in Boston, but what would it take to have this very conversation, this kind of environment in Botswana or in India or somewhere in Colombia? What does it take? And at the end of the day, what it takes is the quality of higher education to create people who think, to solve problems, and who use innovative solutions to meet the challenges of their society. If you look at the history of the, the United States, what you realize is among many things that went right for this country, one was the improvement of higher education systems and the institutions of higher education that were established early on, that were independent, that were creative, and that had the autonomy to work on the most pressing problems of that country at that time. When you look across the world, you find something like this. This is the under five mortality rate in uh, parts of the world. And in red areas, this is Afghanistan, Angola, parts of Somalia, parts of the Congo. You're looking at a probability of one in five, or greater than one in five, of a child not ma making this or her fifth birth. I have two kids, many of us can have kids. And at no point would one, anyone want to imagine the situation that the probability is greater than 20% that your son or your daughter wouldn't reach his or her fifth birth. So part of the challenge that we're dealing with here is the fact that there is very little innovation, there's very little public health, there's very little capacity to solve the problem of these places. Some of them are driven by war, some by corruption, some by poverty, and some by all of the above. But that is no reason for us not to think about addressing these challenges that we see in the world or making it a better place. If you look at the global burden of disease, we again find a tremendously high proportion in this is HIV in, in parts of Africa, and again a severely higher burden in other parts of the world as well. Um, India is certainly high, Papua New Guinea and, and uh, parts of uh, Southeast Asia. If we put malaria on top of this, what we find is that last year about 258 million infections were there in the developing countries of malaria and HIV. That's more than three fourths of the population of this country. And imagine that happening every year, after year, after year. And part of the reason, among others, there are many reasons, but part of the reason these countries are unable to meet the needs of the healthcare system of these societies is the lack of local innovations, local capacity to, to address this. Billions are spent to send equipment and, and, and donations. But by the time they reach, and this is a first hand experience, by the time they reach, let's say, Zambia that I work on, Nobody knows what to do with the instrument. Nobody knows how to use it. Nobody knows how to fix it. There is no local capacity. I've talked to doctors themselves who cannot find some of the basic 
basic tools that we take for granted in operation theaters. That makes all the difference between one and that. So one of the challenges that we have to deal with <coughs> is creating a local capacity. People um, over the last few years started in about 2001, created what are called Millennium Development Goals. A list of eight goals that we hope are universal. That every country in the world signs on to them and agrees to reach them by the end of 2015. And the reason, uh, the reason there are a bunch of them in red is because those are the ones where we can make a direct impact through engineering education, through innovation, through capacity. There are many others, including eradicating extreme poverty, improving the quality of uh, um, uh, lives of women. But there are some that are directly related to better tools, better equipment, better innovative solutions. And there's something that needs to be done. There's only so much I can do sitting in Boston for people of what's on. At some point, they have to take their own lives into their own hand and create solutions. All I can do is to help them in that journey. And that's exactly what we're planning on. So what I'm trying to really talk about today in the next maybe 15 minutes or so are some of the efforts we've been working on. Um, and I've been very, very fortunate and blessed to be able to work in this area is to develop solutions so that people in the developing countries, largely in Africa, but also in Asia, are able to address some of their local challenges in local it's, it's absolutely uh, delightful that the Turkey is playing a major role. So for example, five years ago, Turkey started multiple programs in parts of Africa um, to improve the capacity. One sign of that of Turkish involvement is that now there is a direct flight from many countries in Africa directly to Istanbul. I've taken a flight myself going from Addis Ababa to Istanbul. Um, because there is more involved, because there is more of it. And I think it is important that we address these issues and we continue to make an impact on that. So the vision of the program is very simple, and I'm going to focus on Africa. And the vision is yeah, hey, how you're always screwing me up. How do we merge the challenges in capacity and health? So we have these medical schools, we have these schools of engineering. It turns out that most African cities, large cities, have a school of engineering. But somehow, the relationship solving challenges of the society which have not been addressed. I'll give you an example. Zambia has, uh, in Lusaka, capital, uh, a school of engineering and school of medicine. They're one mile away from each other. And I had to go from Boston to get them in the same room and discuss their problems. So things that we take for granted. We know that there are medical problems. We know that there are challenges in the hospitals and the clinics. And we also know that there are engineering solutions that, and the engineering students are dying to solve those problems. But somehow, that culture of cooperation, that culture of collaboration doesn't exist. So that's the first goal. Second goal is improve the quality of higher education in general so that people are able to take the problems and create their local solutions and encourage uh, that collaboration and cooperation. And finally, create mechanisms. And that includes creating offices of tech transfer, patent offices, and things like that that allow students who are creative and innovative to take their solutions to the marketplace and give them incentives to do that, both for non-profit and for profit. So we created a four-pronged approach um, where we said we'll do four things. First thing was to get students to uh, be excited. We said we'll create a design competition across the eight universities we were working with. Students from any discipline can come up with a tool or a technology or a system or a solution, anything that they think is going to solve a public health problem in their village, in their city, in their town, in their country. For example, somebody says, I have a lot of kids who come who are um, who have handi uh, who are handicapped. So I'm going to come up with a simpler, easier, cheaper method to create crutches using local materials. That's one idea. Somebody says, mobile phones are everywhere. I'm going to create an app to do something related to public health. Anything. There were only two considerations. One, it had to be local, so you cannot look at a problem that had no local basis. And two, it had to be a collaboration between School of Medicine and School of Engineering, or School of Sciences. So at least one person from Engineering or Sciences, and one from, person from Medicine, so that we can create a fostering uh, relationship. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Anybody who, who submitted the proposal, and it, it, it passed through the first round, was invited to a summer school. The summer school was a two week long, and we'll have another, we had one in Uganda last year, we'll have one in Kenya this year. Was an idea where people from all walks of life, people like myself who are academics, who have research laboratories, as well as people who think about innovation from the 
patent standpoint, people who are thinking about innovation from the abstract sense, people who are thinking about policy, they will be the professors. These students from many different countries will be invited to a summer school so they can learn how does one think about innovation outside Africa? How does one think about innovation within Africa? How do you solve these problems? How do you think about it? What is the theory behind it? What is the policy? How do you move forward? Anybody who made it to the first round was invited. Third thing was creating mechanisms for improved higher education. So how do you create a program in biomedical engineering for an undergraduate discipline, for a graduate discipline, and so on and so forth? And they're real challenges. Anybody who goes through that will say, well, if you want my son or my daughter to go into biomedical engineering, what kind of job does he or she have? That's a question. Or if they're really good, why wouldn't they move to South Africa from Zambia? Wouldn't they be brain drain? All of those questions are very real questions that we have to think about creating this. And finally, perhaps the most important thing is to make sure that people who are already in the system, people who are such as nurses, such as technicians, they also get trained on the new equipment that comes to them. The last time they were trained, 1980s, perhaps 70s. 30, 40 years they're working in the same hospital over and over and over again. And there hasn't been any means of retraining, getting them excited about the problem, the solution, the challenge. So how do you do that? So this was a four prong uh, program that we launched about two and a half years ago. And we started off in, uh, in, 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 in universities in four countries. Um, South Africa at the bottom, Zambia, well, five countries. Um, Kenya, Uganda, and Ethiopia. And we chose eight universities. And we chose universities, eight universities from these countries, and then universities from South Africa, because South Africa is a much more um, developed country in that region. So we wanted local mentorship as well. Not just mentorship coming that is coming only from the US, but also local mentorship from South African universities. And they have a lot to manage. So that was the idea, to create these things and work with the students of these institutions. Somebody say, why these institutions and why not others? There were two reasons. One, these are all English-speaking areas. Uh, parts of Africa are French-speaking, and there, there's a language barrier, both for the students and for the people who were involved. Right, so that was one reason. The second reason was we had an open call, and these were the eight institutions that showed interest in this program. So we want, we want to expand this, but this is what we started. We got some money from the, from the Republic of Korea, from their uh, aid uh, program, we got uh, funding from Boston University, and we got funding from United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. 